since I've been with Discovery, about the last three years now, a lot of my role has been working with educational systems in making this transition from print to digital. So that's what I want to talk a, a little bit about today, is how do you work with school systems in going from print traditional resources into a digital environment? And recognizing that that's on a continuum. So there are some school districts and some school systems that are integrating digital content very systematically into their current instructional practices. And there are some school systems that have said, we're going digital. We're not going to purchase textbooks anymore. We're not going to use paper anymore. And so it, it's a continuum. But the one constant along that continuum is the word system. Is We're not talking about organizations that are doing it with one or two super teachers who would have done it anyway. But how do you do it across your organization, whether that's a school system, whether that's a state, whether that's a country? And so the question that we have to ask ourselves first is why? From an educational perspective, what's the advantage of delivering our instructional materials digitally? And if we put the student at the center of this equation, it really becomes kind of simple for us. And so the first thing that we know is that, as we've heard a few times today, today's students are a different generation. They truly interact with information and content in different ways than any previous generation of learners. So without going through all the statistics, this is a quick snapshot of what that looks like. So you get the idea. The second thing that oftentimes we talk about is if we deliver instructional materials digitally, we have the ability to really deliver current and relevant information to our students. And so I'll just give you one example of this. At, at Discovery, uh, two, about two years ago, uh, we developed a, a fully digital alternative to traditional textbook and actually went through adoption states. So we went through places like Florida, we went through places like Texas. And about two years in Florida, there was this thing happening in the Gulf around the oil spill. And so it was ironic that as we were presenting a digital textbook solution aside uh, traditional textbook publishers, one of the questions they asked us was, how often do we update that content? And the reality is, because it's delivered digitally, we have the ability to update it all the time. And so what might be six years or seven years for students to interact with, something that, in this case, affects every single person in Florida, they wouldn't have that opportunity. And it's not just the content, by the way, because oftentimes we think, wow, this is great because we get access to relevant content. But it's also the alignment of that content to instructional standards or to state assessments. And so oftentimes you hear teachers talk about, but my content's no longer aligned or my textbook's no longer aligned to my state standards or to the assessments. And we have the ability, again, instructionally, to make those changes and deliver that so it's always aligned and always current. But the third thing, and probably the most important, and if it stood alone would be enough, is our ability now to deliver content in a way that meets the needs of every single learner within our classroom. And this becomes a pretty big one, because one of my, my favorite studies that I refer to pretty often is this one. And it's a study that was done with six-year-olds, so roughly first graders in a developing country. And the reason I like this is because these kids had never seen technology. So this is a place where they hadn't seen technology, and we delivered mathematics instruction to them in two different ways. One text only, and one text, animation, sound, and images. And then we assessed them. Knowing nothing about anything else, every educator in the world will tell you which group performed better on the assessment, right? It's the second one. There's no instructional benefit to just delivering content one way, when you can deliver it in multiple ways. So if we go back to that question I asked you earlier, in which way do you believe instructional content's primarily delivered? So what I did was I took out everything outside of North America. So I looked at all the, the data that I've collected in my own presentations over the last about year or so. And I looked at North America only. And here's what people in the audience has told me. So these are educators ranging from, from again, teachers to superintendents. About 70% say lecture. About 12 and a half say text. About 10% say hands-on. And about 5% say media. So basically, what we're trying to frame here is this is how we deliver instructional content, or how we teach. Right? Fair enough. I know the researchers are probably rolling their eyes. True, this is my own data. But 
The second question that I ask about halfway through the presentation is this one. Which best describes you? So as an adult educator, which one best describes you? Are you a visual learner, auditory, read, write, or kinesthetic? Here's what people said. Same people. So basically, if we frame the question, how we learn, here's what they say. Is that a surprise? So the idea here is that if we design this from the ground up, we probably couldn't do it more perfectly worse than what we've done. Right? We deliver content in the exact opposite way that we actually as adults learn, much less our own kids. And so the idea is, how do we do this better? How do we use technology to improve upon this practice? So this is a, a great example. And the reason I like this example, this is not high tech. You know, Monica mentioned something earlier. We're not talking about loading as much stuff as we can on teachers. We're talking about how do we become effective and efficient with our educational resources. This, to me, is a great example because this is great for a visual learner. And traditional learning materials do a great job at this, right? You see diagrams all the time in, in traditional textbooks. Here's what they can't do. The same learning object can be great for a visual learner, but it can come to life for a kinesthetic learner. Right? You can start to manu manu manipulate it. You can start to move around within the resource. At the appropriate time, we can then deliver text. Right? So now we have a read-write learner. And then we can play this text or have it read to us to support our auditory learner. This was always the promise of technology. How do we deliver instruction in a way that becomes efficient and effective and meets the needs of every learner and not just those that are comfortable with lecture or with text specifically? So the question is, does it make a difference? And so I looked at uh, two of our partners here in North Carolina specifically. One is Charlotte Mecklenburg. We've been working with them uh, for about three years in science instruction specifically. Uh, and they've integrated digital content in a systematic way across our organization. So here's what they have to say. And then the second example I'll share with you is one that is probably familiar with most people in this room is Mooresville. Now, admittedly, Mooresville is at one end of that continuum, but the reason I like Mooresville so much is because they're the excuse buster, right? Because they perform exceptionally well. Thank you. They perform exceptionally well on state assessments. They're third in the state out of about 115 here in North Carolina, but they spend surprisingly little. So if we go back to that economics case, this is often one thing we hear. How do we afford it? Well, if we look at how we spend our money and start to reappropriate it differently, all of a sudden it becomes clear that we can't afford it. So then, from an educational perspective, the question isn't why, it's why not. And I, I only have time really to address probably the biggest thing we hear all the time, which again, Monica referred to, which is this digital divide. And so when we think about the digital divide, because you'll hear a lot of superintendents say, we can't do this because I have kids that don't have access to this at home, right? Well, first of all, who is that? Roughly, it's about 6% of kids across the country. So US statistics show us that 6% of kids don't regularly access the internet at home. Who are those 6%? Real quickly, they come from households that are under 30,000. And typically, the biggest determining factor is the education level of the parent, which is if they have less than a high school degree, they're less likely to have it. So we're still talking about 6%. Here's the key to this, and this is what I struggle with the most when we talk about the digital divide as the reason for not doing it. We know kids need these skills to be successful when they get out of school. We know they need them to be successful in the workforce. We know they need to be successful in college. The, the digital divide is the reason we should do this in our school districts, not the reason we shouldn't. 
right? If they don't get it at home, which we're saying they don't, then who is it not fair to to not provide it at school? Right? That's like saying, if they don't eat at home, I can't feed them at school because it's not fair. It makes no sense. So we have to think about the digital divide a little bit differently. And a lot of places are. To be fair, Florida has adopted language that says, by 2015, you have to provide instructional materials digitally. We see places like Texas who have gone online for adoption. So this year, instead of going out for the traditional science adoption, they did a supplemental adoption. Places like South Korea who have said by 2015 they'll be digital with their textbooks. Australia, we heard about earlier, 2.4 billion in infrastructure cost. So the big question for us today is where will North Carolina be? So thank you very much. And with that, I will turn it over to uh, Matt.